So I've entitled this a modern day story of how God has shown he can be trusted and be a trusted friend. So when we think about trust, we go in our minds to all those scriptures that, that help us define trust and give us encouragement. And often we think of Matthew 6, you know, about the birds in the air. They don't, they're taking care of, God's taking care of them. The flowers, the grass, the green, all these things, no matter how beautiful they might be or how dry they might be in this time of year, they're in God's hands. So, and how much more important are we than them? That's the thing I'm saying, wow, okay, that, that really sounds good. But in the middle of that discussion in Matthew 6, there's that verse 33 that says, um, after it says, your heavenly father knoweth that ye have needs, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So it became clear to me that the key to developing trust would be to let God be supreme, number one. Invite God's kingdom to dwell in you. And it reminds me of the text, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open, I will come in. Developing trust only comes through a friendship and a relationship. And God says, I'm willing to be your friend if you let me in. And then the second part of that, accept Christ's righteousness. In other words, be willing to give your burdens and concerns over to him. Let him deal with them. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he says. Oh, it was still hard, you know, and I had to give up something, right? So it, it became obvious that friendship with God was imperative if I was ever going to be able to develop the capability of absolute trust, no matter what happened. We heard a great testimony this morning about trust. And uh, it, uh, it's, it touched my heart in, in many ways. You, you need to make decisions in concert with God. Have a conversation with Him. When you face hardships and quandaries, don't look upon yourself. Let God take over. We, we know through Scripture what the kingdom of heaven is like, right? The Scripture says, be part of the kingdom of heaven, be part of the kingdom of God. A grain of mustard seed, yeast or leaven, treasure hid in the field. The kingdom of heaven is like a net. When, uh, when we dwell in God's kingdom, or should I say when we allow God's kingdom to dwell in us, it brings forth a comfort. It brings forth a calm, a trust. When you have a need, you know who you can go to. Of course, we always go to our partner, friends, they're helpful, but there's no one like God listening to his word. And then, of course, Jesus says, until you become as a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so it brings me back to the beginning. The trust that a child has in his parents and his caretakers. That means emptying myself. That means it's, it's not me, it's up to him, right? Yes. All those things sound good, but how do we know that it happens and that it, it can happen to us? And so the scripture tells us all kinds of story. Hey, Moses, God says, trust me. Did Moses trust God? Did he have to be pushed, cajoled, led, directed, right? Those things are okay, so education is part of that. This is not, for the most part, at least in my experience, 
a metamorphosis that takes place overnight. Mm -hmm. So I understand Moses' dilemma. The children of Israel, God says, trust me. How quickly did they forget? They're free. Where's my food? I want the other food. Where's my life? Where's this? Where's that? I go, you know how it is? Does it fit my life? Does it fit yours? Gideon, did he trust God? God says, trust me, Gideon. Oh, let me see. If you do this, then maybe. And if you do that, then maybe. And then God's leading the whole way. The process of developing trust with God is a walk. Is a journey. God says to Christians, trust me. God said, Milt, Jan, trust me. But those were then. Those things were then. It's, it's today I'm worried about. So I want to share with you some things that have gone on in our life. Janice said, uh, not too much detail, but some detail. <laughs> to give you an idea of, of how that I've developed a calmness and a trust when things don't seem to go right. Um, Janice has asked me many times, how come you're not worried? I can't explain it other than it's something that's inside and you have to live it. Right? It's easy to say, just give it to God. He'll take care of it. But through these, these three or four stories I'll share with you real quick, it just those things didn't seem to bother me. And I was willing to go on. So, in uh, 1985, my mother and I visited this church. We were, I was searching, and uh, we came one Sabbath, and there were about, oh, I don't know, about half as many people at church that are here in this room today. And it was quite slow, interesting, but there were good people here. And I left and told my mother, you know, this church doesn't seem to have the things that I need and that my boys will need and things like that. And she said, ask yourself the other way. Maybe it's the church may need you. So that stuck in my head. So we ended up here and that was, that was good. We moved here and I took a job at uh, St. Joseph Hospital in Burbank. I went, the, the day uh, that I came for interviews, I had three interviews scheduled at three different locations in two different days. And after my first interview at St. Joe's, they asked me to stay in the afternoon. I said, uh, no, I have another interview later. I was going to Palmdale. My brother was driving me around. And uh, they said, no, we really want you to stay. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if I give up that other interview, that's another, you know, you just don't get the first job you, you interview with. So I went outside and I told my brother, they want me to stay. He goes, well, you're nuts. You know, you got to spread yourself around a little bit, you know, get some uh, chances. And I said, well, they seem pretty nice. And I said, well, let me go back in and tell them that I can just stay a little while. So I went back in and I met, uh, I saw again Dr. Chang, who was the first person I met. And he said to me, I really want you to stay. He goes, um, I see that you're a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and I can trust them. And I thought, wow. Hmm, he doesn't even know me, but somewhere in his life he met someone that meant so much to him that he could say that. So I said, okay, so I went back to my brother, I'm staying, and of course, unfortunately for him, he had to sit in the car and drive around, and, you know, Burbank and whatever all day. <laughs> anyway, the interviews went on and on, I stayed that night, they went to take me dinner and all kinds of stuff, and they said, can you come back tomorrow? I said, well, I have an interview, and they said, no, I want you to come back tomorrow. So long story short, boom, got the job. And for a number of years, things were great there. I mean, it was a, it was a, a place in the, in the mid-80s that was in somewhat turmoil and, and growing. It's, it's far more, it's, it's better today. But uh, I was in a place where I could grow 
uh, move up, get more responsibilities, more income, more support for the family, get them to uh, schools and, and, and all, all those kind of things. And it just seemed like God was blessing every step of the way at that place. And uh, the sisters loved me. I went to them and I said, uh, I know you want to have a crucifix in my office. And, and I, I don't mind having a crucifix in my office. I think that's a good idea. But I want the risen Christ on my crucifix, not the, the dead Christ. And uh, Corpus. And they said, well, we have to take that up. So they invited me to meet with them and, and counsel, and I had an opportunity to witness to them about what I found in the joy of the resurrection of Jesus. I understand the need of understanding the death, the death of Christ, but the resurrection of Jesus. So I got special uh, dispensation, and there you go. So in my office was a risen Christ, and the, because that was the the way I chose to witness. Um, during that time, they paid for my graduate degree, got my master's, and all kinds of good things were happening. One day, they said, hey, come on over to my office, the chief uh, executive officer. And I walked in, they said, sit down. And I sat down, and they said, uh, we're going to be letting you go. And this is after a little over 10 years. And I said, well, okay. Um, I guess those things happen, and I've been part of many other, the opposite side of that table, and people also. I said, uh, look, just don't say anything to anybody. Janice is working over at the uh, Occupational Health Clinic, and word travels fast, so don't say anything. I need to go to the Laker game. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and then when I get home, I'll tell, tell her. So they, they granted that, <laughs> that wish. <laughs> And so there it was. When everything was just going right, now I had no job. And they gave me a, a reasonable severance package, and I was fairly confident in my abilities. So I thought, well, I'll be able to pick up a job pretty quick. That wasn't necessarily the case. Months went by, and um, it was during the OJ trial, so I was occupied. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I got through that. So then I began you know, to exercise my uh, professional expertise and interviewed. I interviewed in D.C. and Kansas and all over the, the place. And uh, I was always running off at some light. And uh, Janice was concerned as the months went by and the end of the severance was coming and not knowing what to do. During my time in the hospital, I met a lot of physicians, and um, one of them called me one day and said, hey, why don't you start your own business? So, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. That's kind of scary. Look, I'll be your first client. I said, okay. So, over the next eight years, I opened a business and hired my first person. I had to hire my old secretary, who was also laid off the week after me, and another friend, and grew the company from, you know, two or three of us to almost uh, 22 people. I couldn't believe that the great, the good things that God bestowed on me in that time. I didn't have to go to a place all the time. That period of time afforded me additional income, now I have three kids in academy, right? That period of time allowed me to just break away whenever I want. I was able to go to the academy. I was able to coach the basketball team, spend time with my sons in a, in a, in a way that no one else or very few people get to do. I said, God's blessing me in a new way. And great things are happening. Working through, spending time, introducing to the conference. Conference wanted me on the executive committee. Went to the executive committee. The outreach came to a broader spectrum of people. Oh, why don't you chair the board of the academy? Okay, fine. I had all kinds of time. God gave me time to learn new things, to reach out, and most important, spend more time with my boys. Because we like basketball, among other things. <laughs> <clears throat> In 2002, I thought things were going pretty good, and um, 
was approached to uh, by a company that was a startup company to purchase my little group of people and company to be the backbone of their their company. And uh, I thought, well, why is why is God knocking on my door with that? Life is pretty good the way it is. And um, through prayer and just study and recognition said, okay, maybe that's the next venture in my life. God, what are you going to do? So in 2002, sold the company and great things, new things started happening. I lost all my free time. I couldn't spend time at home. I was gone all the time. These are the sacrifices I made, but they had a great bonus program. And guess what? I just happened to have three kids going to college at the same time in a private college, right? And it's like the fear of where is the money going to come from to pay this? Are we going to get loans? And we were able, Janice and I, to put our kids through college and pay for them all through this extra money. It's the money I didn't need. I mean, I could have saved it. I would have liked to have saved it but tens of thousands of dollars going to a place that I would have not otherwise received. How good is God? He's leading. And, I, and I'm beginning to start recognizing in these stories how to trust, right? How to, how to develop a relationship with him. And it just so happened that the headquarters of this new company was in uh, Manhattan Beach. And that allowed me to be down near Santa Monica, where Ken Tori was. And I, and I had gone to Bunny before, and I said, well, I'd like to, you know, see what Ken Tori's like. And I spent one rehearsal there and kind of went away saying that this is uh, a lot. You know, I spent time and stuff. It's more than just fun, and uh, but mostly fun. And But having it down there, I was able to be right down there next to Ken Tori rehearsals, and I didn't have to have anything scheduled on Tuesday nights, and boom, I got a new thing added in my life, and new friends, a, n a new collection of friends that were good. 2014, tired of traveling. God, what are you going to do? I need to, to slow down. Family life is changing. Grandkids are going to be around more. How, what can you do for me? He says, I, I have an idea. A couple of doctors stopped me and said, uh, we want you to be the chief operating officer for our doctor group. Means leaving your company, but you'll still have some ties to them, but we need your help doing X, Y, Z. Oh, okay. Less money more time at home, more relaxing, more thought time. Thank you, God. How, how could you be so wise? <laughs> how could you be so smart? How, how wonderful it is that you laid it on my plate and knew the needs of, of the next phase of my life. I don't know what's in the future. Truthfully, I don't care too much. What is in the future? I, I, I worry about today. But when I look back on the yesterdays, I, I see how God has worked in my life each one of those times. And I say to myself, there's a story there. My trusted friend has cared for me. How, how can I not remain faithful to him? How can I not give him my earnings? And my time, how can I not give him the glory that he deserves for his assistance? How can I not continue to trust in him as a friend? These are modern stories. It's not Moses. It's real life. Sometimes the doors open, sometimes I like to see. But I, I can tell you today that in my life, God can be trusted. I don't worry too much. 
and even about many things. Almost nothing. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> to change the room. And, and it's, it's not about, I don't care. No. It's about who I know cares. Oh, I think we have time for a question or two for Milton. Anybody have a thought they want to share back? A question for Milton? <laughs> As he steps away, okay. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. No. Yeah. I just want to say um, a lot of the places that put him helped many people in our family. The hospital situations, knowing doctors and knowing all the right people for a lot of health reasons in our family. Too. So, yeah, yeah it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, God put me in a place to allow my sister to get free surgery and. <laughs> and and, and so, wow. so many things. So I don't know why I was there other than that's where God like I trust him implicitly. And uh, whatever tomorrow brings, tomorrow brings, Pastor. He's going to get there too. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't make too big a deal of this, but I want to tell you a truth. Um, when I was considering coming to this church, uh, my family was a huge factor, and their visit was a huge factor. My son's recommendation was a huge factor. But another huge factor was I had served with Milton at Glendale Academy when he was board chairman there. You heard him say that was one of the things God led him to do. Our connection and association and my trust in him and his uh, leadership and his goodness was a huge factor in my coming here. So uh, God does work in all kinds of interesting ways. Uh, that was was a very big deal. 